Hi there, welcome everyone to the launch of Ember's fourth annual Global Electricity Review. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by so many of you around the world um, and also a panel of experts from a range of organisations who will join us for an interesting discussion later on about the next steps in this important decade towards clean power. Um, we'll start with a presentation of the key findings from my colleagues at Ember. Um, but I'm delighted to introduce the chair of this event, Nat Bullard, who is a senior contributor to Bloomberg NEF, a columnist for Bloomberg Green, and an advisor, a keynote speaker, and venture partner, amongst other roles. I'm sure he needs no introduction to many of you on this call, um, but thank you so much for joining us, Nat. And I'll hand over to you to, to kick us off. And if, um, if anyone has any questions throughout the presentation, please use the, the Q&A &Q tool uh, provided where you can answer any questions to either the presentation uh, people from Ember or for any of the panelists in the discussion later. And we look forward to a really interesting event. So thank you, Nat. Hannah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to everyone from Ember for organizing this very timely and extremely important event. And to all of you joining us from around the world, this is a good evening to those of you in Asia, good afternoon to Europe, uh, and good morning if anyone like you, like myself, is awake very early on the US East Coast. And should any of you happen to be on the West Coast or somewhere in the Pacific time zones, good on you for joining a call in the middle of the night. Um, delighted to be here and delighted to be chairing this discussion. As I say, this is an extremely important time in thinking about what's happening in the global energy mix and paramount, I think, within that, what's happening in electricity. Ember does a tremendous job of collating, collecting, formalizing uh, a notion of where we sit in terms of the global electricity mix. And I think it is incredibly important right now at this moment to have clarity of data and clarity of expression on where we are. We are in the midst of a very big war. We are in the midst of trade challenges and in some cases disputes. We are in an era of heightened commodity prices. Some might say we're approaching super cycles. Uh, and we are in an era where trade has become complex too. So I think that this is uh, a time when it's all the more important for us to be as clear as we can about where we are, but not only that, about where we might be going. And so I'm delighted to be able to help facilitate this discussion, which will begin with some data and insights from Ember itself. Uh, and then we'll go into a discussion about what needs to come next, uh, and in particular, how we think about different technologies and how we think about different markets. So with that, I believe we're going to begin with some presentation material. And for that, I am very happy to hand over to the Ember team. Malgrajata, I believe we are kicking off with you. So I will let you give a brief introduction to yourself and proceed with the discussion. Thank you. I'm afraid you've muted yourself again. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you, Nat and Hannah, and welcome everyone. Um, so as Hannah said, it is fourth uh, global electricity review report uh, by Ember. And um, let me let me try to have control of this. Mm. So, so as as we as we as we heard from Nat, it is extremely important to track power sector uh, transition. As power sector is the great, the biggest CO two emitter, and needs to be the first sector that is decarbonized by twenty forty, ahead of the global um, economy. So uh, our our report is the first comprehensive review of what happened last year, and we think that it is bigger and better and than than the previous one, and are delighted to to discuss this report uh, today. It is work of about twenty Ember staff and number of uh, advisors who were kind to join our um, advisory panel. And before I, I talk about key findings, um, I will pass to Nick from our data team 
who will explain how we gather data, what is in our data, and how we use it. Nick, over to you. Thank you. So, as Margot Zata said, for this report, we provide the first comprehensive data and look at the global electricity system in 2022. For it, we pulled together data from 72 separate national and international data sources. And on top of our world and regional numbers, we provide the latest 2022 data for 78 countries. Our data also covers more than 200 countries for the period of 2000 to 2021. Now we provide data on electricity generation from all the main electricity sources, as well as emissions, demand, and electricity imports. For all of those 78 countries um, on the map, we do have 2022 data, and those countries make up 93% of global electricity demand. That is what allows us to give the first accurate picture of the electricity transition last year. Now, tracking data on the global power sector is vitally important, and our latest data effectively tracks emissions of 11.4 gigatons of CO2. That's a third of the total annual emissions from any sector worldwide. Despite covering 93% of global electricity demand, there's still some gaps in data availability for 2022 data, specifically in Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. Improving data access and transparency in those regions and elsewhere will be key to track the progress in decarbonizing the power sector, especially as those regions um, are the regions where we will see electricity demand rise the most. Now, today is all about the findings from the Global Electricity Review, but we have all of our latest monthly and annual data openly available on our website now. Uh, so please go ahead and explore the data yourself as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. So now what happened in 2022? I'm trying to move the slide. Okay. So this, this graph shows what happened globally uh, last year in the with the electricity sector and the changes there. Global electricity demand grew by 2.5%. Uh, and this is in line with the average la average from last 10 years. And you, you can see uh, demand in gray here. Um, three of this, um, three of this, um, three major economies were responsible for growth in this uh, demand, um, and they accounted for ninety-three percent of this growth. These were USA, China, and India. What is amazing that uh, growth in wind and solar um, met eighty percent of this global demand increase. Wind grew by 17% and solar grew by 24%, making solar the fastest growing source of electricity for the 18th year in a row. To put this in perspective, um, the rise in wind uh, generation could have powered almost uh, the whole UK of the whole of the UK. And the rise in solar could have powered the whole South Africa. However, other clean sources didn't perform that well. Nuclear fell. Hydro that was that was mainly due to um, outages in France and some reactors being switched off in Germany and Belgium. Growth in hydro was held back because of the uh, extreme droughts in some regions, most notably in Europe. Other renewables uh, grow uh, slightly. So that means that coal and other fossil fuels had to rise uh, to cover the remaining gap in the electricity demand rise. However, Coal and other fossil fuel growth was limited significantly by wind and solar. 
So coal grew less than, than, than fell in nuclear, as you can see here. Gas fell slightly by um, not 0.2 percentage points. And um, um, this, this is the second time in three years when gas fell. This was due to the global energy crisis, which was uh, brought by Russian invasion of Ukraine. Because there was a rise in fossil fuel generation globally, we saw a rise in CO2 emissions. They rose by 1.3% to a new record high. Now to focus on wind and solar who are set for a quick rise to the top. So this graph shows how wind and solar are changing the power mixes in every region of the world. In 2022, wind and solar generated 12% of electricity globally. But in, uh, in three regions, namely um, Oceania, Europe, and North America, the proportion of wind and solar in the mix was greater. Europe started first that shift to, to wind and solar, and uh, now has 16% from wind and solar, but number of countries generate as much as one third of the power from wind and solar. These are Germany, Spain, and Netherlands. Oceania recently overtook Europe. Uh, and that's thanks to a um, great rise in wind and solar in Australia. North America is also ahead of global average with USA generating 14% from wind and solar. Asia started later the shift to wind and solar, but is catching up and fast. So now Asia is at 11% as a region, but China generates 14% from wind and solar. So that's almost the same like USA. India generates 9%, Japan 11%. Latin America and Caribbean are also at the same level as Asia. They generate 11% from wind and solar, but there are great examples of countries which are well ahead of this. For example, Chile generates 28% from wind and solar. Um, the only two regions that lag uh, in these transitions are Africa and Middle East. However, uh, across a, a continent of Africa, we also have great examples of, of leaders such as Kenya. And it is only Middle, Middle East who is just at the, at the beginning of the journey. So, um, to meet global net zero, wind and solar must become backbones of the power sector globally. They need to generate 41% of global electricity by 2030. This requires for them to maintain high growth rates. Um, on this on this uh, graph, you see on the left solar and wind. In blue, you see they, they grow for rates so far. So they were quite high and they need to be maintained at similar level. Uh, they need to, um, the level they need to be is a black dotted line. Uh, so that is 25% for wind, for solar, and 17% for wind every year from now to 2030 to be, to be on, on, uh, on target for net zero. 
maintaining high growth rates at the beginning is easy, but as technologies mature, like wind and solar now, it is more challenging, but, but we believe possible. So these green lines are from IEA Renewable Report from last year, where they predict what the growth will be um, in the coming years. We believe that this is far too more conservative. We, uh, we, we believe that uh, we will see much greater growth in both wind and solar, and especially solar will be very strong as the global manufacturing capacity has increased. So now I would like to hand it over to Dave, the head of our global, global data insights, so we can hear more about our exciting forecast we made for this year. Dave, over to you. Thanks so much, Margarita. Um, our main finding is that a new era of power, the falling power sector emissions is likely to happen as soon as this year, thanks to the energy superpowers of wind and solar. This graph shows the global, the global electricity generation since 2000. And at the bottom in black, you can see that total fossil generation rising. And you can see that that gradient has been slowing over the last decade. That's because of the growing green tranche above it of wind and solar. Had wind and solar not been built, and instead that generation and electricity demand that come from coal and gas, then fossil generation would have been 20% higher in 2022 than it was. So although it's unfortunate that fossil electricity generation hit an all-time high in 2022, you can see that wind and solar are already delivering to reduce emissions. And very soon, wind and solar will push the world into a new era, an era of falling fossil generation and therefore of falling power sector emissions. It wouldn't be the first time that fossil generation has fallen year to year, but it's the first time that would have happened outside of a recession. We forecast that the that fall will happen this year, um, this year although that fall will be small, um, uh, it would get bigger every year um, as wind and solar grow further. That means that power sector emissions may never again peak higher than they did in 2022. Other research bodies are forecasting um, that moment happening soon as well. So in January, the IEA forecast sometime um, by 2025, that moment will come. And I want to run through the reasons why we believe the first structural fall will happen as soon as this year. We use the growth rate of the last 10 years. So the um, solar and wind growth is consistent with many market outlooks that are a bit higher than the IEA, which looks quite conservative and not as high as other predictions, though. The small growth in other clean electricity seems, if anything, a little conservative, given what we know on hydro and nuclear generation so far for this year. And the electricity demand growth, we assume the same as last year, which seems reasonable given um, a similar forecast in, in, in global GDP rise. And these assumptions together would mean that fossil generation would see a small fall of 47 terawatt hours or 0.3% in 2023. Both the EU and the US forecast to see big falls in fossil generation this year, uh, unlike uh, the rise in 2022. And also we track the electricity demand for 76 countries and the latest data in the first few months of this year reinforces their current view. So we have some degree of confidence um, in, in that fall happening within this year. So what about the different regions? Uh, in Latin America, clean power generation has been rising in line with electricity demand, leaving fossil generation unchanged for about a decade. The Middle East is more or less the opposite, where almost all the increase in electricity demand has been met with fossil generation. And in Africa and Asia, somewhat in the middle, clean power is rising, but it's not rising fast enough to meet all of that electricity demand growth, and therefore fossil uh, generation has been slowly rising. In North America and Europe, electricity demand has been broadly unchanged. So where there is clean power coming online, it's displacing fossil generation. And indeed, fossil generation in the US and EU both peaked back in 2007. But you can see coal and gas still playing a big role in the electricity mix there. So it's exciting to see the US, Canada, UK, Germany making pledges of sorts um, to achieve 100% clean power by 2035 barely a decade from now, which would mean not just the phase, out, a phase out of coal power, but also the phase out of gas power as well. 
the 2020s is the implementation decade. It's, it's still possible for the power sector to get to a one and a half degree pathway. The wind and solar need to maintain their high historical growth rates to 2030 to get us to a point where we're installing well over a terawatt of wind and solar capacity every year. That's four times what was added last year. Other clean power needs to grow modestly. And if those things happen, not, not only will coal power begin to fall aggressively, but we'll also start to see gas power phasing down as well. 2022 will be remembered as a turning point in the energy transition. Due to Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine and the global energy crisis, many governments rethought their reliance on fossil fuels. And clean power is needed not only to replace coal and gas generation, it's also needed to replace oil in cars and gas heating in homes. And 2022 came a game changer for heat pumps and electric vehicles to make that happen. So how quickly emissions will fall this decade is not yet set. It will depend on the actions of governments, businesses, citizens, and how quickly we can rebuild um, our entire energy system around clean power, and especially around solar and wind. What is clear is that we're at the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel age. Thank you. Uh, and I'd like to hand over to Nat to begin the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Dave, Magujatha, and Nicholas. That's very a, a very thorough and a very uh, helpful way for us to begin our discussion. So with that, I think we've got quite a lot to reflect upon. And I'd like to begin with a reflection from a sort of a global perspective before we dig in a little bit more by industry and by market. And so for that, I'd love to begin with Brent Warner from the IEA and with Kings Mill Bomb from RMI. And Brent, I'm actually going to, as soon as you, as soon as you appear on screen in front of me, uh, I'm going to begin with you uh, to get your reflection on what uh, the Ember team has put together and your sense uh, for what the outlook is in, let's say, the next year and then in the next 15 years. Thank, thanks, Nat, and thank, thank you very much for, for Ember for the invitation to participate in the, in the launch event today. Um, I mean, I think we, we agree very much from the International Energy Agency, agree that we are at this turning point uh, in the electricity sector and that there are multiple pathways ahead for us. So we see these, as mentioned, the, the strong and growing momentum for renewable energy technologies, um, the, the also the strong movement on electrification technologies that was mentioned on heat pumps and electric vehicles. So the growing centrality let's say, of the, the electricity system and a clean electricity supply is, is definitely happening, is accelerating, uh, and is at the forefront of really discussions with policymakers around the world, is also at the forefront of ambitions uh, being put forward. So when we then look forward to a bit longer term, and we think, so in the near term, I think these, as we're, we're changing directions here, let's say for overall emissions for electricity sector, it's a bit of, can we get renewables to outrun uh, the renewables growth to outrun electricity demand. Um, but then very clearly in the longer term, this becomes clear that wind and solar PV will lead the way for electricity sector emissions to fall. And it's really just a question of how fast they fall. Um, so there are multiple pathways ahead uh, as we detail in the, in the World Energy Outlook each year that we see very much that policymakers are, are at the helm here. And there will be thousands of decisions made by policymakers uh, around the world in the years to come that determines really how fast this transition goes uh, and how quickly we're able to deploy these technologies that are here today and there are new innovations on the, on the horizon. Um, so just to give a feel for a couple of where we see some of those things going, for example, in our announced pledges scenario, uh, where we, we, an, uh, we analyze all of the pledges that have been put in place and been put forward by countries around the world. So these include the nationally determined contributions and net zero pledges uh, in the longer term. It's very clear there will be a sharp reduction in emissions uh, in the electricity sector. And that CO2 intensity that's mentioned in Ember's report today will be falling very precipitously. So by, we estimate by 75% from 2022 to 2040. So electricity will continue to get cleaner as we shift away from coal-fired power, particularly as is already happening in advanced economies, but this is going to 
then also take place in emerging market and developing economies in China, India, Southeast Asia, uh, moving forward. And that permanent feature that drives these transitions is the growth of solar PV and wind. As mentioned, we would be looking at continued expansion of how quickly we can build new wind and solar. Uh, wind and solar would overtake coal-fired power before 2030. And by 2040, under, and again, the announced pledges scenario, solar PV and wind would provide about 40 or about half of all electricity in the world. So we're noting that today, uh, 2022 marks at 12 percent to be going to 50 percent um, by 2040. Now unfortunately that still means the electricity sector is a, is a big emitter at that point over five gigatons per year in 2040 and so there's a risk that this still isn't fast enough. We need to go faster to get on track towards net zero emissions by 2050 and a pathway that limits overall temperature increases to 1.5 degrees or less. So there are a number of these uncertainties. I mentioned policymakers how quickly they take decisions, how quickly they move this forward. We also, of course, are infla uh, facing inflationary environment right now. Um, there's a question of developing domestic industries and how much governments move forward on this task. At the IEA, we've highlighted how clean energy supply chains are very concentrated. And this, in the long term, is an energy security risk um, that we, we want to look for and to address. So in the end, there's a few aspects that and then uh, I'll close there is that on the permitting and, and uh, electricity network side, we see these as two potential risks, but also that need to be there as enablers of transitions. Uh, and the IEA will be putting out a special report on grids and exactly this point and how we, do we make sure that they are an enabler and not a bottleneck of transitions. And also we need to think about how the systems of tomorrow and really investigate deeply how those systems will work and be secure. So one of the projects we're, we're doing is looking at the seasonal variability uh, of renewables and how the system can remain energy secure in all years in all systems around the world. And then finally, we are working on an update of the net zero report uh, that will come out this September, which uh, again is reflecting then the path that we need to be following uh, to meet our overall collective climate objectives. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Brent. This is a very, very comprehensive review on, on where we might be going. But Kingsmill, I would love to get your reflection because you and your team have done quite a bit of work on exactly this idea, you know, imagining ourselves sort of da da dancing atop the peak and then the change to come from there. Please, I would uh, love to hear from you. Um, brilliant. Thank you very much, Matt. So um, I think it's a great piece of work as ever from Ember. Um, and, and I also really like the framing that we have indeed reached peak. Uh, fossil fuel demand in the electricity sector. Um, just to, to set out why this is extremely clear is global electricity demands about 30 compared to what I was growing about 3%. So it's about eight or 900 terawatt hours a year of growth and solar and wind are now um, about 4,000 um, terawatt hours also growing about 20%. That's, that's about 800 terawatt hours. And you can just do the math yourself. It's pretty obvious that um, when you add in what's going on in nuclear and hydro, we are at the peak of the fossil fuel uh, system in electricity. Um, and furthermore, of course, electricity itself is pretty much the only growth sector left um, within the uh, 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 fossil, sorry, electricity itself is now growing into all of the other sectors. So we've seen peak demand in, in industry. Um, uh, about a decade ago, we've seen um, pretty much peak demand in buildings, peak demand in transport is very close. So um, this is a very important moment, I would suggest that Ember has identified. Um, the other point I would make is we we need to think a tiny bit about modeling um, of the future. So, you know, actually all the bottom up modeling that, that folks have been doing for the last 10 years has been wrong. Um, and, and, and actually, strangely enough, top down S curve modeling has been far more successful, logistics curve modeling. Um, and that would uh, suggest that certainly by um, by the end of this decade, actually about half of electricity in Europe and, and China is going to be com coming from solar and wind, that the 40% target is completely achievable um, by 2030, and that the, the kind of growth that Ember is talking about can be continued for uh, uh, an, an extended period. Um, and then the um, just two final points I'd like to make. You know, First of all, it's quite interesting that in Ember's analysis, nowhere do they talk about minerals or intermittency, which is what people talk to me about all the time. And the reason they don't talk about it is because it's not an impediment at all. Um, you know, we have plenty of minerals, intermittency is completely soluble um, with current technologies. You know, these are fake issues um, 
put into the debate by um, fossil fuel incumbents to try and slow change. They're not actually slowing change. Um, and then the final point I will make, if I, if I may, is that we've got to realize that China's leading this, this shift. Yeah, I mean, half of the growth in uh, solar and wind deployment is, is or almost half the growth is coming out of China. Um, so this is a uh, China shift um, and that every indication is that that will continue as China seeks um, energy independence. And this is why, again, um, the addition of security to the mix will speed up change, not slow down. Kingsmill, thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate you're, you're, getting, you're getting in front a little bit of a question that I can see coming in from multiple people, which is regarding critical minerals. So uh, <laughs> you've set up, you set up a little bit of an answer and provided we have time, uh, we'll be able to dig in a little bit of that. So let's talk <clears throat> sectors by sectors, uh, specifically as we go through here. Um, and with that, uh, Bruce Douglas from your electric, I'm going to turn to you a couple of minutes, please, to sort of give us what you sense is like what we need to get right this decade uh, in order to reach these potentials that, as King's Mill suggests, are provable with logistic modeling rather than anything than anything else. But how do we how do we continue to make that logistic present the logistic future? Yeah, thanks a lot, Nat, and thanks to Ember for the invite. Again, a superb report. Um, and uh, a tinge of positivity for once, which is really great to see, you know, that peak emissions piece and the way Dave ended there, the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era, something we should definitely celebrate. Um, I mean, a couple of points on the report first. So negatively, you know, coal is still the leading el electricity source. Emissions are still growing, uh, so we need to do something there. On the positive side, um, I noted 60 countries have over 10% penetration of renewables. That shows diversity and market development, so really good signs, um, and that 80% of the new electricity demand um, from RES and significant growth in the, in the renewables. To paraphrase the economist Rüdiger Dornbusch, he said disruption takes longer than you thought it would, but then it happens faster than you thought it could. And I think we're at that point now, that inflection point, totally agree with Kingsmill on, on that. Um, to your question, I mean, there's four main items I'd say that are are critical to, to further accelerate energy savings, um, not just gas, fossil fuels, but also electricity. The EU has had the largest year on year drop of uh, gas demand ever, okay, because of the conflict, but you can see it can be done and power should also follow. The second is electrification. We would advocate electrify everything that can be electrified with renewables. That's the, the best way to decarbonize. Thirdly, grids and storage, quite overlooked often in the, uh, in the energy transition. So roughly, um, you need about 60% investment in renewables. You need 40% in grids. That's both transmission and distribution. We at Euroelectric estimate in Europe alone, we would need 400 billion euros of investment in the distribution system by 2030. I think Irene estimates like a trillion dollars per year globally. Um, in the grid system um, globally every year, up from about 300 billion today, so tripling on the grids. And finally, of course, in renewable generation, see some great increases uh, across the world in, in many markets, but we need several things to, to really accelerate that further. First of all, permitting, fast and efficient permitting, that would unlock enormous amounts of renewable deployment globally. The second is diverse and secure supply chains, Government's now realizing energy security is a key national interest, and we need those supply chains to be secure and diverse. Uh, and finally, we need that uh, investor confidence, going back to several of to, to what Brent and Kingsall pointed about, about how important the policymakers are. We need long-term, stable uh, legislative frameworks so that investors can get behind this movement and really put the trillions in place that we need. Thanks a lot, Nat. Fantastic, Bruce. Thank you very much. Um, the rest of me, I'd like to go to, to you next um, for a bit of the, the flavor, specifically from wind and with a, with a, a global view. Great. Thank you, Nat. Um, and thank you to the Ember team for the, for the invite and a massive congratulations to you all on this report. It's really great to see. Um, it's also really great to see that wind accounted for almost 8% of the global electricity generation in 2022, which is set to increase. Um, and so we're definitely a technology at the forefront of the energy transition. Um, and with wind energy 
Gigawatt's current status update. Um, the sector now boasts a 906 gigawatt of total installed capacity, which is a year on year growth of about 9%. So really great to see. However, we are more than aware that there are vast amounts of untapped wind energy potential around the globe. So with wind energy being at the core of the future of, the, of electricity systems, there are various challenges that need to be addressed um, to ensure that we deliver the full benefit and stay on track for 1.5. So I know Bruce has already mentioned, but our global wind report um, recently highlighted the massive challenge around supply chain. Um, so in essence, we need to be encouraging and facilitating policy that creates the right, right environment for local and regional supply chains to develop and to help accelerate the deployment of renewable, um, renewable energy supply more broadly. So collaboration and cooperation must be the underlying approach to help regions develop supply chains that can deliver what markets really need. So looking at the data from the Ember report, um, we can see Europe dominates other nations globally in terms of the countries with the highest shares of wind energy produced electricity, which is obviously great. Um, in terms of nations with the highest levels of wind en generated electricity, we're also seeing the likes of China and the US dominate these markets. Um, however, our report found that whilst Europe has been leading the market for years, um, that the region along with the US um, will be the first to fill the pinch of the supply chain or the supply chain pinch. Um, so these, these regions have grown on strong, resilient supply chains, but the, we now need to see a rapid um, growth of these, of these supply chains to meet updated ambitions. And just one, one final remark is that it's not just about accelerating the global supply chain, but the full value proposition that can be measured in the forms of jobs, local value creation, as well as economic growth. Um, and so when we really think about the potential, it really is multifaceted and really quite exciting. So I'll leave it um, there for now in the interest of time. But thank you, Nat. Thank you. Thank you, Rishmi. Joshua, tell us a bit um, from, from the SOMER perspective. Uh, thank you. Um, and also congratulations, everyone, on the report. Um, it, it's, a, it's so great to be here this afternoon. Thanks for inviting uh, the International Solar Alliance to be a part of this uh, this morning, afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, I would want to just actually start on a start on a positive note. Um, in the last decade alone, um, the cost of solar and wind has declined drastically. Uh, solar being about eighty-two percent. However, the cost of coal and fired energy remains similar, while cost of nuclear fired energy increased by sixty-one percent. Why I mention that is that um, major conventional fossil fuel energy providers have criticised the use of uh, renewables and have portrayed it as, a, as costly and unpredictable. One of those things uh, for the acceleration that we always find is uh, the need for uh, higher amounts of um, advocacy strategies to be deployed into the various areas that we struggle often. So I'm just gonna be talking about two important things that uh, we look at, especially in terms of transitioning into the solar, uh, uh, solar renewables. Um, one of those things that would need to be addressed quickly in this decade, um, decade is to look at robust um, financial backing from large organizations, extending subsidies and incentives to green energy, solar, for instance, that will pace up the pro progress. Uh, solar and renewables as a whole require massive investment in developing countries. Uh, blended finance, for instance, which combines concessional public funds with commercial funds, has been and will continue to grow as a powerful means to direct more commercial finance towards impactful investments that are unable to um, pro proceed on strictly commercial terms. If you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, blended finance has achieved a notable success, attracting over 61% of global concessional financing in 2020 alone. Um, Africa needs very urgently to increase investment in electricity infrastructure. About 570 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa lack access to electricity. Existing infrastructure is simply not able to meet the demand. Yet, the region currently accounts for just about 4% of global power sector investments. Achieving universal access or inclusive transition in this decade by 2030 will require tripling annual customer increases. Catalytic instruments like blended finance that I've mentioned are highly critical for scaling up electricity investments in Africa and rest of the world. This um, will certainly ensure an inclusive transition. And of course, um, the other thing I was gonna mention is the construction of off-grid solar power electric facilities around Africa, like the ones, uh, the ambition shown in Nigeria for a large off-grid market 
which has developed to cope with chronic electricity reliability issues, which, will, which is destined to provide 80% of the energy demand if all plans go to place and go to good. And they plan to develop a 13 gigawatt off-grid solar PV capacity in this decade. That's just one exemplar. Um, one of those areas that one of the speakers did mention previously was about the issues um, in terms of policymakers and having influence on, um, on, on the legislative requirements for investments to be eased and for reliability and investments is very important. The International Solar Alliance, um, which I represent, uh, are heavily involved in both these uh, subject topics that I've spoken. Uh, we've launched recently the, the um, the blended finance uh, facility. Uh, we're raising, uh, mobilizing $250 million towards uh, solar transition, towards uh, risk mitigation, towards payment guarantees, and also um, insurance mechanisms that will go in place to ease investments into, uh, into Africa and then onto Southeast Asia and other parts of the Pacific as well. So um, with those um, words, let me stop here and open for any further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. I'm sure we'll have we, we've got questions coming in um, with uh, with with quite a clip. So <laughs> I'm hoping we'll we'll get to a chance to answer quite a few of these as they come through. Let's talk a bit about China and India specifically. Magujat at the beginning mentioned that U.S., China, and India were 93 percent of all growth in electricity. So obviously, incredibly critical to look at these, especially given that two of these countries have a significant growth trajectory expected. So with you, I'd like to hear from you first about like how we think about from an Indian context peaking emissions within this decade. Great. Uh, firstly, congratulations to the Ember team for such a comprehensive review of the electricity sector. Uh, now that coming to uh, regarding the discussion on India, as you rightly said, India is on the path of high electricity demand growth buoyed by high economic growth. Uh, both with increasing demand from, you know, the rising population, as well as, you know, the needs have changed. There's a lot of urbanization happening. And also with all this temperature change leading to high electricity demand for cooling. So India need to transition uh, not only its existing capacity, which has very high share of coal base uh, now, but also to meet uh, its high incremental new demand from more sustainable and clean energy choices. Now, with respect to that, India did commit 50% of installed capacity by non-fossil fuel sources by 2030 uh, and reduce emission intensity of its GDP by 45% and further net zero by 2070, you know, as part of its revised NDC. Um, there have been a lot of studies being carried out both uh, by the likes of IEA as well as Central Electricity Authority um, has also come up with National Electricity Plan. Uh, so based on that, you know, what we need is to add about 38 to 40 gigawatt of renewable energy every year. But if you look at the current rate, uh, you know, in the last two years, India has added about, you know, only 15 gigawatt of renewable energy, which is huge, but compared to, uh, you know, where we need to get to, which is 38 to 40 gigawatt, there is still a gap. Uh, but if you look at, on the other hand, we have added only about 1.2 gigawatt of coal capacity in the last two years. So, which is a promising thing, uh, but, Government has recognized that there are not enough tender issuances. And just two weeks back, it announced that India will come out with 50 gigawatt of annual tender issuances, uh, which will be in the form of plain manila, hybrid contracts, and RTC contracts. Uh, but more importantly, I think for India to you know, have such a higher share of penetration of renewable energy, we would need flexible generation sources. So that's another thing which you know India is looking at because uh, the use of battery storage is limited. So again, SECI as well as NTPC have announced uh, aggregated tenders uh, for storage as well. Now, quickly, you know, uh, in terms of what needs, so tender issuance I've talked about, but what we need is DISCOM. 
uh, which is the off taker risk needs to be uh, minimized and the payment risk needs to be minimized. So that's something which India needs to work upon with improving the financial health of distribution companies. We need further market design reforms in the form of time of day pricing so that the costlier, the more expensive power can be again, uh, you know, uh, be absorbed. And lastly, I would say, uh, you know, upgradation and digitization of the transmission infrastructure also becomes very, very critical in this respect. So there are other measures, but yeah, these would be quickly something, you know, which India really needs to kind of focus on in the next few years so that we can see, uh, you know, the coal-based power or, or peak emissions from coal-based to uh, peak in the next, in this decade itself. Thank you. Uh, a clarification for those who may not be as, as deeply familiar with the Indian market. RTC is round the clock, is that correct? Okay. Sorry, uh, yes, and, RTC is yes. round. Yes. Uh, and this this comes are the distribution companies. Is that is that correct? That's correct. Okay, good. Thank you. You think some making, sure for, making sure for my own purposes <laughs> that I still get all these terms correct. Um, thank you. <clears throat> and when when I would love to hear from you a little bit about China. What's it going to take you know, by the same token uh, for an even bigger system, um, still with quite a lot of fundamental growth ahead of it, to reach uh, to reach peak emissions this decade. Thank you. Greetings from Beijing and congratulations on the release of this great report. And it is also an honor for me to uh, speak here today to share our understanding of how power sector uh, low carbon transition in China. And for the backgrounds, I think many of you have uh, mentioned that China has been this uh, poster kids in the RE development. But, but now when we talk about like low carbon transition in the electricity sector. In China case these days, the biggest challenge for this decarbonization in the power sector is this strong um, energy security narrative. And this narrative has emerged over the last three years, fueled by a few episodes of power shortages in several uh, provinces in China and also the Russia-Ukraine crisis. And ever since the power security has become the top agenda in China, an offset dynamic between like renewables and fossil fuels seen elsewhere in the world actually has becoming a mature reforcing relationship in China. And we see rapid deployment of renewables and at the same time more coal. And the latest goal for the wind and solar from China National uh, Energy Administration for 2023 is actually uh, 160 gigawatts in capacity and also like 15.3% of the energy mix. And that is like a 1.5 year on year growth in China. And meanwhile, we also saw an approval of nearly 100% 100 gigawatts of coal power projects in 2020, in 2020. And the coal boom has clearly continued into this year, according to one of the Greenpeace, Greenpeace's upcoming work. And why there is this um, weird or mu mu mutual reinforcing relationship in China? We think that there, this is due to two major reasons. On the one hand, Coal power plants in China are expected to act as a source of flexibility or capacity adequacy for renewables, at least in the next five or 10 years. When the storage or the market reform are considered not ready enough to cover the variability challenge the VR, VRE brings to the grid. And on the other hand, coal power plants are still a go-to option for the local governments if they want to hit econom economies and energy security goals at the same time. And according to Greenpeace's upcoming work, in the last two years, ensuring power supply has become the major reason for the new approval of coal power plants projects in China. And to enable the power transmission from Northwestern large scaled RE power station all the way to the Eastern uh, provinces in China to enable the integration of RE is also among the major reasons. And now what does this uh, mean for the power sector um, emission peak? 
and for the climate goals. We think that continuing going back to the supply side and going back to coal power plants for power supply and power security answers will result in um, financial burdens and also create carbon locking. And as a, the Amber colleague said before in the presentation, the 2020s is the implement, implementation area, era. So I think we, we think that the central and local governments in China will need to solve the power security problem in a more systematic way. And the outstanding problem of China's Chinese current power system is the not, not the lack of capacity. It's actually the lack of flexibility and responsiveness of the system. So the, the system operation rules or the electricity policy are mainly made for base low power system that does not call for much flexibility. And in order to integrate higher ratio of um, renewables, and to pick the power sector emissions. The urgent tax, except for keeping a high RE growth rate, is also to make adjustment or to make revolution to the electricity system itself and to enhance the uh, flexibility system to better in, embrace this higher integration of re renewables in the future. And thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this has been a very comprehensive set of discussions and we have just about eight minutes left for some questions. Uh, I see a lot have been answered already as they've come in, which is actually very helpful. So I'm gonna pull through a couple uh, that, that haven't yet been answered that, that I want to get a, a reading on from the room. Uh, and Reshmi, the first one is actually for you. You'd mentioned something about the full value proposition. Could you clarify that a little bit by what you mean? Because I think this would be a very valuable uh, response, regardless of the technologies. What do you mean by capturing the full value proposition? We're expressing the full value proposition. No, it's a fantastic question and more than happy to, to share my thoughts on this. So I think when we look at value, I mean, there's there's a lot of pressure on ensuring that we create just economic value. But I mean, value can be multifaceted in the sense that we need to look at, obviously, economic value, socioeconomic value, social value what value renewable energy projects can bring to localities as well as it as what it can do for national um, renewable energy roadmaps and what it can do for the renewable um, for the for the national energy mix. So I think it's really important to look at renewable energy supply as a more holistic picture and not just providing a solution to one thing, but also creating value in other areas that are not necessarily taken into into account when we're looking at um, uh, renewable energy deployment so i think that's what, what that's what i was trying to say by um value proposition no much much, much appreciated and do you think I, i'll follow with my own do you think that do you think that there's like how do we improve that and like how is it that we that, that the industry becomes better at making that statement is this about convincing policymakers, the public financial markets technology providers like where are the points of leverage there if you were to make that that value proposition more clear, well, I think I think now, I mean, most people are pretty much aware of the just and inclusive energy transition or the just and equitable energy transition, and so I think I think we're in agreement that this very much needs to happen alongside the energy transition. It can't be considered as two separate things. So I think we're working in a positive direction to integrate these various socioeconomic factors into the energy transition more broadly. But I think there's definitely a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of recognizing this on a policy level. Um, both in uh, from a local perspective as well as at a national level, but I think I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. Good, thank you. And Brent, I have one for you. Um, and this is relating to uh, you know here in Washington, we're in what they call the spring meetings, IMF, the World Bank, and the rest of the group. Um, and they've noted, you know, their latest uh, economic outlook that it's a constrained fiscal environment. Uh, and I'm curious how you think about squaring the circle of a constrained fiscal environment with needing trillions of dollars of new investment. Yeah, thanks. To that. No, I think it's a really important question. I mean, the, obviously, the, the economic outlook in general is such a huge factor in how energy systems will develop, uh, whether that's on the how demand will move forward, but also, as you mentioned, the fiscal environment. Um, I think, I mean, one thing that's very clear is that policymakers and governments around the world uh, are really setting the table and setting the scene in the, for the transitions. But governments themselves cannot fund 
the transitions. And so we need to be facilitating private investment, uh, whether that's companies themselves or the investment sector coming in. And so those rules need to be clear. We know that there is a lot of investment available. There's a lot of financial capital out there looking to be involved in the clean energy transitions. So I think that's that's not really the, the challenge is to kind of maintain the focus um, during these periods and to make sure that uh, the government set the rules and set the frameworks in the right way. Um, so in that way, then I think the, the risks of the fiscal situation become less. Um, and, but it is something we need to, you know, to be aware of that this is very different also between advanced economies and emerging market developing economies, how important government capital is in the overall transition. And it's very clear that financing and international financing, particularly in emerging markets, is a critical part of actually continuing the momentum we have for transitions and accelerating those. Uh, without that, it would be very difficult. So this clearly is a, I would say, is a headwind that the, we're having difficult fiscal environments. Um, but at the same time, part of the reasons for those headwinds are also motivating more action, more commitment to transitions. Companies, countries see that they would be, have been better off if transitions have gone faster. Uh, and so I think that's also important there. No, I think that's a that's a very important an important back test, so to speak. What if we had gone faster, uh, in particular at times when the fiscal environment was much more accommodating versus today? And I've got one last brief one, and I'm going to split it between Bruce and between Kings Mill, and that's about um, how the two of you think about <clears throat> emerging technologies, uh, some of which are you know so-called at the grid edge, some of which might be things like more distributed nuclear power very long duration storage. How are you putting those into your, your thinking between now and 2030? Um, Bruce, I'll start with you first. Yeah, great question that. And you know, if we look into the crystal ball, then there will be new technologies coming online, no doubt. Um, and as I mentioned in my, in my commentary earlier about storage, we urgently need um, large scale storage and that's short duration, but also long duration storage to facilitate the build out of renewables globally at the scale we need them. Um, so we will see technologies coming on board, but I think it was Dave mentioned earlier that we, we have the technologies available now. They are affordable, fast, secure, and can be deployed at scale. So let's use them. Um, that would be my comment. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there in the interest of time, maybe over to Kingsmill. Kingsmill, you've got you've got literally one minute, but I am sure you can give us something in that time. Right. Um, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> no, just to reiterate that. I mean, I think um, let's be clear. We're at twelve percent solar and wind today, as Emma has shown us. Um, the constraints to the de deployment of solar and wind only start to really kick in above um, seventy when they start to get expensive. An awful huge amount of headroom now before we need fancy technologies. And of course, the the fact that these new technologies are coming in digitization of grids, for example. Um, is incredibly helpful because it just continues to raise that ceiling. So uh, I, I think, you know, the key point to get across is there's nothing stopping us continuing to grow this, nothing apart from policy, at least, um, the, the, these technologies rapidly for the rest of this decade. Um, and, uh, and, and anything we can do with these other technologies will be helpful, but is not absolutely vital. Thank you. I, I think that that's, that's very important. So 70% being sort of around the time when these become urgent. And what, what, what's our sense for when that might be? I mean, is that that's, that's, more than, that's more than 10 years from now. That's outside of our, our 2030 timeline, I would say, yes? Yes, yes. I mean, you know, e even if you take our, our approach and, and just follow the exponential growth curve of solar and wind, you're going to be at 40% in 2030. Um, this, is a, this, is a 20, this is a late 2030s problem. Excellent. Listen, I, I, uh, I, I'm delighted again to have been, had the opportunity to share this. Uh, it's one of the promises I always make uh, to anybody joining the call, as well as those uh, here speaking uh, in, this, in our virtual chamber, is that I always finish on time. So we are just approaching right now the hour. Uh, and I want to say thank you for, for the hundreds of people who were online joining us, uh, for the dozens of questions we had coming in, and for the incredible amount of insight uh, and detail and granular thinking from the Ember team and by extension, <clears throat> everybody assembled here to have this discussion. So thank you very much for joining us. 
I would urge you only with one other thing, which is if you've not done so already, please check out the full and comprehensive report, which is online now, uh, and do share and share widely. So thank you again to Ember, uh, to all of the panelists, and to all of you who are listening. Thank you.